hello, hello, and welcome back to the Steadfast Runners podcast, the Steadcast. Excitingly, we are rejoined this week after his absence by Kieran Clements, and I think we have quite an exciting discussion lined up for this week. So welcome back, Kieran. Thank you, thank you. Back from the pits of hell, aka America. America, the pits of hell. Uh, joking and joking I am. I, I love America. I had a really good time out there. Got to visit some of my old teammates in New York, and got to visit my girlfriend in Boise as well, so... Good time. Good that, times had by all. That is good. And that's Idaho for anyone who's never heard of Boise. And Idaho is in the middle of nowhere for anyone that's never heard of Idaho. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure many people will have heard of either, but it's a surprisingly lovely city. So no, I had a really good time. Fabulous. Well, great to hear it. So let's jump on to its first thing now that you're back. We can't waste any time on it. We have to do a review on the Ineos 159 challenge. Now, I want to start for all of those listeners with those sickening statistics that we've all heard a million times before. Here we go. 26.2 miles, 4.34 per mile, 2.50 per kilometer, 17 seconds per 100 meters. Yep, 69 si- seconds per lap yeah. of the 400 meter track. There we go, that was the one I was going to next. So <laughs> we really have covered a bit of everything on there, but how exciting was it when he finally did it? I know that I, mean, I, was, yeah. I was jumping out of my seat. No, it was it was insane. Just, to, I mean, you, we, you could kind of tell he was going to do it from fairly early on, I'd say. Like he had a little bit of a rough patch where he slipped off the pace a little bit, but after he got back on it on there, he just looked so good. But yeah, it was exciting to see. It was the middle of the night for me and I was wide awake watching it. Yeah, it was. I thought it was really exciting to kind of see it, how they'd laid it out. And I think in terms of how we can structure this talk, obviously we've got to talk a little bit about you know his actual running, obviously, because that's the main thing that happened. <laughs> uh, I want to talk a little bit about the course, though, because the, the concept of it, you know, everyone knows the concept. Uh, and it's worth mentioning to our listeners, we've actually got it up on our screen at the moment. Yeah, I'm actually struggling to te- keep my eyes off it a little bit. But. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's quite a, hi- quite a hypnotic spectacle, isn't it? But, um, but yeah, I want to talk a little bit first about about the actual spectacle that that was this event that's put on by Ineos because the one problem that I think everyone universally agreed with the Nike Breaking 2 project obviously which you and I have talked about so much over the last few years is it just felt cold it felt empty and there didn't really feel like there was much atmosphere and you know you look at the contrast that Ineos have created to that with with what they did you know getting everyone involved really making sure that people were involved you know people were involved in yeah no definitely it almost had like a like a kind of a festival kind of atmosphere to it there were so many people lining the streets i saw i don't remember the exact number but i saw there was just thousands and thousands i think it was 13,000 no no definitely not it was more than that but either way several thousand people lining the streets of vienna to watch one of the most remarkable human achievements ever yeah definitely and and something that i think is well worth mentioning is that when nike did their project it was on a closed off track and the people that were there i think were there by you know special nike invitation it was, only yeah, it was invitation only as you know celebrities athletes that sort of thing this was just anyone in vienna could just come down and just take a look yeah definitely and i think that was the biggest difference really in terms of what will make this event you know, lasting in people's memories is because had they have done this in the same format, he could have done it. It would have appeared on the front page of the BBC and the BBC Sport page for a couple of days or whatever it would have done. But I don't think many people would have remembered it. I think what Ineos have done very cleverly if they've made this something that people will remember. They have, yeah. I mean, I think a sub two hour marathon is always going to be remembered by people, but because they've made it such an event and such a, they created such a large amount of public interest I think you're right like it's it does just feel that much more special than the breaking two project did and not just because of the end result but like you said yeah the process was a lot more a lot more engaging for sort of the general public yeah and I think a lot of that was probably carried over I think Kipchoge probably was a lot more confident knowing that he was going to achieve it and I think he was pretty confident that he could gear everything up in response to him you know being confident in his own achievement oh definitely I, I mean looking back you can it's hard to tell going into the event but looking back it's almost he almost had it in the bag from the word go really to yeah. me well do you remember the the sort of thing that we closed off our podcast that was ahead of this we said you know we're gonna he's gonna get to the end and if he does it and if he does it comfortably 
we're going to look and say what were we ever worried about and mm. you know pretty much up to like think well it's exactly that i mean what were we worried about he was always going to do it yeah well i think you know whilst we've got it up on the screen you know we can talk about a couple of moments and a couple of things that maybe we found interesting um the first thing i want to know about is are you aware of any reason why there's those two guys running behind him do you th- this seems to be an unanswered question and somebody yeah, who's got so- experience i'm intrigued to see what you say <laughs> well i would love to have a good answer for you there but i have absolutely no idea what the two behind it was i mean that was one of the main differences again between this and breaking two was the different drafting formation you can see that they used a reverse v instead of a forward facing v yeah for the guys in front of him and then the two behind i haven't got a clue i, I don't know what they're there for to be honest there must be some kind of drag effect or maybe it's even just a, a mental thing for kipchoge as if he falls back he suddenly then runs into those two guys and it's just to keep him there yeah make him feel like he's insulated type of thing do you know what it's interesting you should say that because obviously i've watched all of the feedback things and the videos where people kind of do their own version of what we're doing now just you to know, speculate yeah and you know there seems to be a pretty solid answer for people running in front of him i think everyone knows that that reduces drag, drag and, and resistance yeah um, but there's no one really has mentioned the two behind him and the best things that i could think of and i'm no aerodynamics <laughs> expert by a long long shout but unless I don't know, unless it causes, once you're running in the clean air, that air has got to get, you know, dirty, thick or something again at some point. Who knows, yeah. You know, if that becomes thick and, you know, if it becomes, the air becomes more resistant immediately after your main subject, you know, in this case, Elliot, is that, you know, does that have any slowdown effect? So then do they have these other two people there to, you know, break it up almost, you know, like breaking the, breaking tension on the, on the water? I don't, you know, I don't know. Um, but the other thing is I did think exactly like you suggested is it's quite nice knowing that you're holding off someone. Yeah, having somebody sort of behind you is just a little bit comforting rather than, yeah, if you're just, if he's just chilling in last place and then <laughs> for the entire run and then goes and runs, you know, a massive groundbreaking performance, it's it's kind of, it might feel a bit strange or a bit, yeah you know a bit of a maybe an underachievement i don't know yeah i I mean i don't think there's only going to be a way to call it an underachievement no absolutely not although it would be interesting to have seen or just to know how much quicker could he have gone on that day yeah well here we go then we can move on quite rapidly because i have some speculation i don't want to use the word conspiracy theory (laughs) but i do have or the words conspiracy theory but i do have some speculation so Ian, who um, helped us at Parkrun, you know, the organiser who yep, helped yeah, us do some him. filming. Shout out, Ian. He was actually blessed by being able to go to the event. And I caught up with him the following week at Parkrun to sort of say to him, you know, what you know, what was it like? What was it? And, and yeah. he told me that it was obviously a fantastic event. And it was very exciting. He said that from his perspective, um, Kipchoge never looked really out of breath. He said the paces looked like they winced a couple of times, but no, <laughs> but, uh, but Kipchoge never looked tired. But... And here we go. This well, is the... he never does. When he ran the world record in Berlin, remember, he sprinted through the line and jumped on his coach, yeah, Patrick yeah. Sang, didn't he? Yeah. Um, but here we go. So he, he, this is Ian. I want to speculate. This is not mine. And Ian, if you are listening, these are this is what you said to me, whether you remember it or not. These are your theories. <laughs> um, two main areas of speculation. One, he might have already done it in training. Oh, I would highly, doubt highly it. doubt that, but we'll get into it. We'll say, what's the next one? And the next one is, you know, how much faster could he have run? Could he have maybe run 158.59, but he knew he had to hit 159 because Ineos didn't want their image to be <laughs> image to be broken. <laughs> well, yeah, that's the thing is if, if he goes out and runs 158 or, do you know what, let's go crazy, 157 or so, which, I mean, you never know, he may have been capable of doing that with the amount that, those shoes the drag from the paces and the course if you add up all of those factors about what the science says that would make the 159 performance i heard somebody quote that being worth as slow as about a 212 wow now we know kipchoge without all of those things even in old shoes is at the very least a 204 performer yeah. and that was at the very start of his marathon career yeah, yeah. when he was wearing the adidas adidas adios i think it was adios adi right. zeros and his insoles fell out of the shoes and he ran 204. That was, yeah. I, think, I think that was when he became, when he came second to, was it Kip Sang? It might have been, yeah. Uh, or, either way, he came, so he was finished second in that marathon. Yeah. He ran about a 204. So let's say, for argument's sake, he's a 204 guy. Minus the 12 minutes that this person, I think it was on Twitter somewhere, 
or perhaps it was on a podcast i've listened to a number of podcasts on this and we're adding to that list now so yeah. hopefully give us a listen i promise it's good we'll come up with some different opinions but if you take that 12 minutes that was quoted by that person that puts him at a 152 with yeah. all of these advantages if he's in the exact shame he exact same shape he was on that day in berlin yeah so how much quicker could he have run yeah who knows yeah it's, and it's a i mean you know saying 150 and then finishing up with anything other than a nine just sound crazy at the moment it's, but i mean finishing up with a nine sounded crazy up until about <laughs> two three weeks ago yeah so. that's that's it um so some interesting things that I think are w worth talking about on that point is there is a paper that was written probably 30 odd years ago and I can't remember the guy's name but if you go onto YouTube now and you listen to any video or podcast anything that talks about the marathon as a concept there was some paper written like say 20 30 years ago who I think I know what you're talking about and he and he said you know the, the hypothetical fastest run that could be managed by a human being in ideal everything conditions is this and it was 157 something, around, something that. around that yeah and that was supposed to be the pinnacle of human performance i do yeah. remember that yeah however that was before that was in ideal conditions but that was i think what they were insinuating is that was under normal race circumstances yeah and the one thing that you absolutely just cannot forget about this project is that it was an experiment it's not under normal race yeah. conditions so having in and out pacemakers means that you have a constant drafting effect having the lead car be so close means that you have even more of a drafting effect the shoes we could do a whole podcast and maybe we will I, just I think, about the shoes i, I think i'm gonna get point, i'm yeah. gonna get into the shoes at some point because yeah. the prototypes that kipchoge wore for this were just on a whole nother level to anything that we've ever seen yeah in running before although but, i want i want to say this you know because there's obviously talk about shoes and there's controversy con well, excuse me controversies which i think we could maybe talk about in a second I believe though that you could realistically you could put him in flip flops, and I think he would have probably run the same sort of time. You know, I, I oh, I heavily disagree. Really, that's yeah, interesting. Yeah, I, th I think you put him in the next best pair of shoes f from a brand that isn't using a carbon fiber plate, and I don't know that he does it. Interesting. Yeah, I d it is interesting. The one point I would make, though, is obviously these, you know, and we'll maybe we'll move on slightly to, you know, whilst we're still on this topic of controversy, controversies, and yeah, we'll just we'll like just that. quickly mention that I would be shocked if Kipchoge had run it in training. We'll just we'll disregard that a little oh, bit. Yeah. Sorry, no. Ian, but no, I, no, just, no. I don't believe that that's possible. No, well, certainly, you know, you'd be burn out pretty quick, but I reckon it's probably entirely likely that he could have run like a two o five or something like that in training. You know, something what I'd call a race time. I would but. imagine what so. Kipchoge's training is relatively public if you know where to look. Yeah. Um, I'm not so sure about this most recent block, but I'm fairly sure he's been fairly public about that as well. And what he does do, which you are kind of along the right lines with, he does do as part of his key weekly sessions is a long run at a fairly good clip. But the thing with these long runs is he does them in Kenya at altitude on the dirt roads and the hills. So yeah, that's true. I didn't think of that. Yeah, he wouldn't. It's unlikely that he would have gotten anywhere close to that actual time but if you put in all of the conversions for all of the advantages that he'd have with pacers on a flat course on tarmac and at sea level yeah that's true then suddenly yeah he would have he almost certainly would have done workouts and long runs that would have indicated that yeah he can do this yeah no and you know i i was pretty confident the whole way going through it just it felt like the right time didn't it it felt like it yeah, had that definitely. certain level of magic about it um you know and it is interesting though but to talk about maybe some of the controversies maybe to move it on because you know there's no secret there's no speculation he's done it whichever way you cut it a human being on his own two feet has run that time yeah exactly there's only so much that we can say about it really there's <laughs> yeah. only so many times that you can say hey look kipchoge's done a 159.40 he's well, run the sub two hour marathon these were his splits. These were the scenarios Absolutely. that he did it under. Well done, Ineos. Pat yourselves on the back. But yeah, yeah no, we do. We want to try and do something a little bit different here. And yeah. actually, talking about the controversy with shoes isn't completely different, but it is something that, yeah, no, we do need to touch on. No, well, this is it. I feel like, okay, maybe you couldn't have put him in flip-flops and expected him to run a sub two, but I reckon had you have kept him outside of these prototype shoes and maybe kept him in his normal shoes, you know, which are these next percents that obviously you've got some strong opinions on mm -hmm. 
I still feel like he could have probably done it in the old in in the old shoe, quote unquote. In the in the next percent in the old next percent shoe, I imagine he probably could have done as well. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the difference for those listening between the next percent and the prototype that Kipchoge was wearing for this attempt is that there were I think there was three. I'm not a hundred percent sure. Don't quote me on this. I'm not a scientist. No, no you're right. You're but right. from what I've seen of the images, there were three carbon fiber plates in these prototypes. And they were sandwiched between a special type of Nike foam, an energy generating foam that they had somehow come up with, which I think is also in the next percent. But when you sandwich carbon fiber plates between these this foam, what that basically does is it acts as a spring. Yeah. And the amount of energy required to get performance when you're wearing those shoes versus let's say if he was running in a pair of barefoot shoes, let's say he was running in Nike Freeze, yeah. Nike's barefoot shoe. It takes a hell of a lot less effort in those spring-loaded carbon fiber shoes than it would have done in a pair of freeze. Yeah, it's, or if he was running barefoot. Yeah, it, it is interesting, and to me, I was quite. Surpri- I mean, I'm surprised and unsurprised that he wore these different shoes because you know, looking at the image that we've got in front of us here, to anyone who's listening, you might not know what the heck we're on about as well. The next percent of these shoes that Nike have released, and if you go and watch any marathon over the last twelve months, there's a good chance you're going to see somebody running who's up in the front. Oh, there'll be ninety nine of the first hundred people will be wearing these shoes, yeah, and they'll be either bright green or bright pink. Yeah. So just just so you know what to look out for, <laughs> um, and then yeah, like I said, this image that we've got in front of us everyone else is wearing these next percent pink shoes whereas Kipchoge's are white and just the heel is pink and that for me made me think oh they've just done him a special pair just for the race it was only then after the yeah it's not a, run. It's one of the sort of only really known within sort of the the quite keen running community that yeah he was in a really 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 advanced prototype for this attempt yeah and that's I don't have any problem with him wearing that for this attempt like it was a science pro- it was essentially a science experiment like we've said before so why not give him every opportunity to do it why not make it sort of as easy as possible for him to succeed yeah. which is what yeah, they definitely. wanted they wanted to see if a human could run a marathon on a t- in under two hours it's then if these prototypes come to be released to the general public or start being drip fed into certain selected professionals and not everyone has the opportunity to race in them that's when it starts to become a problem especially among elite athletes because then you have people that are losing out on prize money that are losing out on spots on teams for things like the olympics is coming up this year for example yeah you have basically if you're wearing these shoes you're getting a head start if you're not in them you're conceding a minute two minutes as much i've heard as about six minutes over a marathon distance wow. well there you go so obviously these are going to charge opinions and i think before we mm-hmm. go too far down the rabbit hole on this pod <laughs> i think we can maybe put a pin in this one and say that there is definitely an opportunity for a whole pod yeah we'll draw a line under the shoes yeah. but basically yeah he was in a really advanced prototype for this and they obviously gave him a pretty big advantage and gave him the best chance possible of achieving a sub two hour marathon, which he did. Yeah. So yeah, like you say, in this in this example, you know, fabulous. But let's maybe move on, you know, in terms of controversies, maybe let's talk about some of the reaction that happened around this because, you know, there's been plenty of discussion and I actually want to bring out my interesting point, which is the sun. He's uh <laughs> so Sam told me he had this point before we started recording and wouldn't let me know what it was. So this is gonna be a big reveal for me as well. Well, this is more so we can all just have a laugh because oh the, I am going to the most reputable of all places, the Sun newspaper. Oh, Christ. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my thought was after the after the actual yeah, run took place, I was over the moon. Obviously, anyone who is a fan, I think generally of running and marathoning, you know, they have to look at this as a good moment. Mm-hmm. However, I went to the Sun newspaper to see what they would say thinking and without stereotyping too much i think there's more of a football generated lager lout kind of audience that you know i think so i'm expecting them to have somehow found like a negative spin to put on it well to be fair the actual article itself wasn't you know the the article was incredibly standard it was this guy from kenya ran this marathon in this time (laughs) blah 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 where it gets exciting and like it does on a lot of other things is uh, on the internet is i went down into the comment section fantastic you know and we've got some proper proper juicy comments down here that i think we can read out and i'll I'll keep it clean as i can 
um, without being too political. Some of them are really quite upsetting, actually. Um, but let's see what I can find. This one made me laugh a lot, though. Running clearly has a racial bias. All the top runners like Kipchoge and Farah are Kenyan or Somalian. Time to scrap this racist event. <laughs> what? <laughs> wow, I mean, the less said about that, the better, I think. We'll let our listeners... Um think decide what they may about that yeah i mean it just just, it's amazing what people think uh let's have a look and see what else there was here we go look this this one is from a (laughs) this has got to be a false name this absolutely cannot be a real person's name bert dingle wow (laughs) (laughs) commented uh look I was there and ran this course last year and the course was 350 metres short, so he didn't break the two-hour mark. False. Well, Bert, um, (laughs) I hate to break it to you, but I think Ineos actually specially designed this course for this challenge. (laughs) Yeah, well, the way to... Fair enough, Mr. Dingle. (laughs) Well, the way to fight back at that outside of, you know, what the hell are you on about is the fact that he says he ran the course last year. Well, the fact that this has been a 2019 project, for starters, Mm. you think this was announced in May, I think it was like the 1st of May or something it was announced, or 6th of May. Yeah, it wasn't long after the London Marathon. Yeah, so the fact that that he thinks it was 350 metres short, it makes me laugh because... It's a very... I think we can ignore that comment and just sort of put it down to (laughs) trolling. Yeah, well, if anyone... If anyone watches the event or saw it live some of the things that you can pick up from it is the orange lines that you see on the course were actually there to keep him specifically running the distance running exactly 26.2 yeah Yeah. yeah, exactly you know and interestingly as well if you look on the long straight it's actually repaved they repaved a central part of it Um, well i heard they repaved the entire thing i heard that they actually repaved the corners now this you may not even know this actually they repaved the corners to have a slight camber similar to that of a velodrome or an indoor track that's interesting so that he would lean slightly as that, he would go around there that is and unconsciously and it would make yeah. it just a little bit easier for him getting around the corners because if you remember that little bit where just a tiny gap formed which we're probably coming up to not too long i think it was around 40 minutes or so yeah, into yeah. the race or the run yeah it was it was on the corner which yeah. obviously we flagged up before as that might be the difficult bit. That's the bit where he got away a bit. But Ineos must have obviously thought of that as well. And they made that little camber. So there's a fun little fact that some of you may not have known. Yeah, that, that, well, I didn't know that. No, I didn't think you would either, yeah, actually. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's a good one. There you go. There's my bombshell. Let's continue with yours. Yeah. Um, and again, just before we move on from the sun and its dreadful commenters... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so we won't make this the slating commenters of the sun podcast. no but but i must admit this did make me laugh the only thing that would have interested me in this manufactured record inverted commas <laughs> is if one of the pacemakers who had done most of the hard work said sod this i'm going to race kipchoge to the line and beat him oh had, no had that happened where would the headlines have been well oh they've not watched it have they well oh, steve God. yeah <laughs> what you what you'd know is that at most what one of these pacemakers has run in an individual gauntlet has probably been all of about five about or six k something yeah. like that yeah. you know so um <laughs> so yeah i i think that steve whatever your surname was, Brown. I don't think he's watched it or no. researched into it. So I think no. he's read this article. I just... I think he's been a silly head. I think he may have done. I, just, I don't understand how <laughs> these people like <laughs> like this guy. And we'll, we'll try and move away as soon as we can from no, just agree. bullying people commenting <laughs> on the Sun newspaper. But how do you write that comment out? Without doing any research on the topic at all, or really watching it, or knowing really anything about it, with all due respect, no, and you and write it, you reread it, and then you think, yeah, <laughs> yeah, well done, me. I'm gonna hit send, <laughs> and then have the willpower to not immediately delete it. Yeah, you click away from the web page and you get on with the rest of your day without thinking. Yeah, oh, I've been a bit silly here. I think I think the thing is as well is and just like I said, we will move on. I promise. I promise, listeners, we will. <laughs> but you know, the fact that all the comments and the articles even say things like he was assisted by forty pacemakers or forty-one pacemakers, you know. You don't have to be a genius to, <laughs> to be able to count to like, you know, the five or six people that he's got in front of him, mm. um, you know, and then obviously there's a couple behind there's, him. Yeah. It's not hard to, yeah, no, it's, there's a lot of, yeah. a lot of documentation, I suppose, uh, yeah. out there that does talk about the pacemakers switching in and out. Like you don't have to do a great deal of research to figure out no. that, <laughs> that that's how they did it and that they had a special formation and 
hilarious yeah, yeah it's no, crazy so that's it so in terms in terms of controversies obviously we talked a little bit about shoes we talked a little bit about pacing and the kind of experimental nature of it but i think you know the most important thing to do to bring away from all of this is 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 that proof that it can be done and a question that i've got for you maybe that before we kind of move on because interestingly this was not the only marathon record that was broken obviously on this no, weekend you know within the case of about 30 hours obviously there was a ladies uh, world record as well which we'll get into i just want to talk about what is the evolution of this event and what i mean by this event is i mean these kind of experimental marathons the london berlin chicago all these kind of iconic world marathons and that goes right the way down to you know the marathon that could be local to you whether that's you know brighton or edinburgh or you know anywhere in yeah. the world you know, I think those will stay relatively similar to how they are at the moment. You know, we can't expect somebody to go out and all of a sudden we have a, a top list of, you know, Kenyan runners on the start line of, you know, the Bob's Burgers Marathon. You know, <laughs> we, we, yeah, we, we're we not going to see that, but I think it will show people that you can run faster and people will, I think this will yeah, get no, people definitely. excited about it. What I'm interested in is obviously now this is the second run of its kind of kind, its nature to have taken place. What is the evolution of this? You know, because this is an Ineos event. Yeah, you know, previous and one was a, we had a Nike event. Yeah, previous one was a Nike event, and those are clearly the ones that can afford to put on these enormous spectacles, mm -hmm. right? Does this evolve as you know they can do it again next year, and we'll see if Kipchoge can run one fifty nine thirty nine? You know, or, or so, how, how does it evolve? You know, in, in in your opinion, in my opinion, and this is more of a hope than anything, is that I think that this sort of event is now done at least on the men's side. They've run the two-hour marathon. He's done it, and I think that's that's what it's all really been about. There's no real logical barrier in this event or really in any other event that I can think of that would be such a massive achievement that it would be worth the time of somebody like Ineos or Nike or any whatever other big company putting on an event like this. So I think this type of event may potentially be done. I mean, people are talking about stuff like... Oh, you put you attach like a rocket onto Noah Lyles and see if he can <laughs> run sub nine for the hundred meters. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> hey, maybe we'll get something like that. But I think this type of event where you just have the focus on one or two or three people going after one time and it's all really scientific and it's like a manufactured performance almost. I think that that probably will now give way to racing. Yeah, and that they will just continue to Kipchoge, for example. We'll continue to run in the Olympics. We'll continue to run in London, in Berlin, yeah, in all of the other sort of big, big major marathons around the world. And I think that we probably won't see another event like this for a while, mainly because this was the big barrier yeah. that needed to be no, broken. I agree. And and the thing is, is you know, as as good as it would be, maybe to talk about you know a ladies' record or something like that, you know, which I think would be logically i mean sub 210 yeah. maybe on the women's side exactly what could i was be something that you could think of but, for this, but 210 yeah. doesn't seem to hold the same magic as a sub two does no it doesn't and and it's and it's really sad because as an achievement you know we shouldn't put men above women or well arguably i'd say that cost guys run a day later might have even in terms of a performance an athletic performance might have actually eclipsed kipchoge sub two that's how yeah. good it was but the thing is it doesn't have that you know it doesn't have the magic around it because it isn't no. you know it isn't the fastest a humans run and unfortunately you know if if you want to look at it from a, co a totally balanced way unfortunately it's it's not going to be fair anytime soon you know if yeah, you, no, obviously if not. you put the two people next to each other in the start line and said right koskai and kipchoge off you go all of a sudden all of a sudden 15 minutes sounds like a hell of a difference yes yeah. well do you yeah. know what this is being really ambitious but it's just popped into my head if you wanted to get a real like insane achievement on the women's side i think the way to go might potentially be a sub four mile yeah because no, i mean I if you look at that. if you look at how hassan ran at the world championships and the 1500 meters i mean she cruised she ran from the front absolutely crushed the competition in say it was like a 351 or two or something i can't remember exactly what the time was but it was a really fast time one of the fastest times ever recorded run from the front all by herself and it converts to that converts to about like a 407 or 408 mile yeah which i mean that's well, well, it was 65 <laughs> 65 years ago when it was happening the other way yeah you know, in the in the men's yeah side, i mean it's it? it's relatively if you put her in you know in a pair of special shoes maybe you make it like a slightly downhill mile on the roads or something like that 
yeah, man, get a get a women's sub four mile. Yeah. That'd be sick. That'd well, be really cool to see. Yeah, and that's and, and that's something that's interesting. You're talking about the evolution of this event. You know, there's there's a few things that I could see happening. One would be, you know, another distance or another barrier. You know, the two hour marathon mm. has been hailed as that last barrier, really. So it seems like you say it could it could end now the fact that Kipchoge's run this marathon. Yeah. The other thing that I think we could see is maybe the evolution of this style of event is like we say it's been run by big companies would there be any interest in pick a name out of the hat someone like adidas for example doing their own event you know and maybe even doing it seeing if they could get another guy yeah or just do or maybe you know have the team nike you know have in the same way because something that we i think or something that i think was discussed with this ineos event is it turned running especially marathon running which is long miles by yourself you know Mm. it's running you know this better than anyone is it's a pretty solitary sport, isn't it? Oh, absolutely. You know, so to make this a team well, effort, there's, there's literally a it's a book or a film called The Loneliness of the Long Distance Runner. So that that pretty much sums it up, doesn't yeah. it? Yeah. So you know, to make this a team event, and they made this cleverly, they made this a world event as well. You know, think in that mm. group of paces that we've got on the screen in front of us, we've got Norway and we've got Kazakhstan and we've got Australia and we've got Kenya and we've probably got Ethiopia in there somewhere as well. You know, we've got everything in there, and they've made this a world event. So would there be any interest in Adidas saying, look, you know, we could run this almost like a Tour de France kind of style where we get half a dozen of our runners, you know, a load of maybe generic pacers or something like that. And mm. then it maybe does become a more technical route and, and to talk about shoes and, you know, and all that kind of thing. Could you make it, you know, you could deliver battle of the shoes almost. You could, yeah, I mean, you could deliberately a, focus on it. Personally, as an, as an athlete and an, as, a, as an athletics fan, I would hate to see that. No, fair. I really, I just, I don't think that that's the way it should go. I think I'm all for, I'm all for moving the sport in a modern direction, hundred percent. I, but I don't know if that's the way to do it. No, I'm all for fair. appealing to a mass audience as well. But yeah, I mean, one of my biggest ideas that I, I mean, maybe we could do a separate podcast on it in the future is turning running racing, turning athletics meets into like a horse racing type of thing so getting odds on all of the different runners yeah. and having people gamble on different races like imagine that I'd be like oh who who have you got in the in the 5000 like oh i've got 100 quid on mo farah yeah or who have you got in the 200 yeah i've got 50 quid on christian coleman or something like that yeah, yeah. Um, yeah stuck a tenner on adam jamili to win the olympics like yeah cool stuff like that and you could take that all the way down to like grassroots levels you could take that down to oh i've got a tenor on Jack the Lad from down the road to win county champs in the cross yeah. country, you know? Like, yeah. And do you know what? It's interesting because, you know, we talk about maybe the corporations, you know, maybe we don't want to, we want to focus more on human achievement more than on corporate achievement. Absolutely. However, athletics, now that I'm actually talking about it, it doesn't have that kind of, you know, if you go and watch, you know, I was watching the boxing on Saturday night. You've always got your sponsor, sh- you know, your sponsorship, your main, you know, betting company, which nine times out of 10 it is plastered on the middle of the, yeah on the canvas in the ring yeah. and then you know usually on their shorts they've usually got a couple of betting companies so it's interesting because i've never even i mean even like how football players have the sponsor along the middle of the shirt I and mean, yeah. there's, there's a few people that are calling for that to be taken away and they're now selling shirts without that on them but yeah. i mean that's how the clubs make money that's how the players yeah. make as much as they do and anyone who's really had any involvement with distance running at a higher level will know there's really really limited money to be made i mean if you just brought in something like if you just allowed somebody to have a couple of sponsors on their vest or yeah like a temporary tattoo or something on their arm or something like that yeah that would bring in so much more money to the sport if you just wanted to have like i don't know michelin just written like across your vest or something like that there was actually on this subject just quickly there was a lot of controversy around somebody who is very good very forward thinking in terms of bringing running into the next sort of the 21st century almost yeah nick simmons who was an american runner i think he placed second in the world for the 800 meters in 2015 or 13 something like that right um 142 runner really really good runner and he had started up his own company called run gum which i'm sure a few people will have heard of it's basically it's a caffeine chewing gum so that you don't have to drink like a red bull or a right, coffee okay. or something before a race because he didn't like that because it would affect his stomach fair so he created this gum and started his company and he'd got some temporary tattoos made of the gu- of the company's logo and stuck them on his biceps yeah. when he wins a race he chucks his arms up in there hey. and flexes his biceps so he did this at i 
I don't remember what race it was. I think it was the American Trials. And he won the race and he flexed and got in a lot of trouble for it because he was advertising. Wow. And that to me is ridiculous. Yeah, and it... I'm yeah I'm quite astounded at that and, and thinking about it you know we don't think of athletics for some reason because I think this is maybe the Olympic effect of it because let's be honest a lot of people ignore the athletics world outside of the Olympics mm. purely purely because they probably don't know where to watch it more than anything else and, and uh, no yeah, it's, right. it's nowhere near as accessible as it once was I mean it used to be on sort of primetime TV in the in the 70s 80s things like that I mean yeah. you tune into BBC One and you'd see Steve Overt running the 1500 over at White City yeah not so, anymore but, but it's interesting because obviously we're so used to a lot of other areas of sport being commercialized and things like that. And, you know, to talk about my other love of, of boxing, you yeah. know, back in the day, you used to get there's I can't remember, there's one, there's a famous fight from, from way back then. Um, oh, God, I can't remember the guy's name. But anyway, he has literally got a website, you know, temporary tattooed on his back or something like that and it's massive it takes up his whole back and like, <laughs> which is a lot of back on a pro boxer exactly and he was a heavyweight as well so he's a oh, big, there you go. big old a, lump hell of yeah. a lot of back but the thing is is you know and the way that you talk about it is yes every single fight gets introduced you know you've got the buffer who says it's brought to you by x y and z person or yeah. you know or, or company like i say you've got william hill or someone in the middle of the canvas yep but at any point you see all of this going on, you know, such and such is sponsored by X, Y, and Z. To any point of that, do I watch a fight and go, geez, that wasn't an amazing achievement by the fighter? Yeah, no, exactly. Yeah, you and, don't. And, and that would be interesting to try and maybe bring that into well running. Is you now get, you'll get certain events. So, for example, a race like the Virgin London Marathon, yeah. Virgin Money London Marathon, like they're sponsored by Virgin. Why can the competitors within London Marathon not have a sponsor outside of their shoe company? Yeah. Why can you only represent Nike? Why can you not represent Nike and Tesco and Cadbury and yeah. you know w- whatever? Like, no, it's interesting and, and yeah. yeah. So so yeah. To to bring it back back round to the point that we made before we move on is that it's incredibly interesting to to say that look the evolution of this event maybe these experimental runs purely to achieve boundaries are maybe mm. done, but there could be some other way of making an event like this exciting and the final point that i want to make on this course specifically that was used for ineos yep and this is something i said to you the other day which i think would be enormously cool is if they could somehow use this course for a publicly accessible run in the future yeah we did speak about that and that would be, i'd love to run on it personally yeah well, i'm sure you would as well well like we were saying the other day if i'm in austria at any point you know it in in my running career as it were whilst i whilst i can still run you know you better you know i'm definitely definitely going down to this course and i'm bringing well, my running shoes to- i was gonna say even even if you get to if you're 90 years old and you're, yeah you're there with your great grandkids you're gonna get yeah. them to push you around in your wheelchair around right. a lap of the course exactly like, it's, you know. it's where history was made exactly you know and the thing is is that if you go to ifley road they've got a blue plaque on the on the door you know on the yeah. door on the gate rather you know so they've got something of notable there and you know there's obviously we're used to seeing memorial statues and things outside football clubs for managers that took mm-hmm. you know so like outside Ipswich you've got Alf Ramsey and you've got Bobby yeah, Robson, got Bobby you Robson know, that, yeah. people who took you significantly you know into these upper echelons of the sport I'd love to see a Kipchoge statue <laughs> yeah in the middle of the v- of uh of Vienna but, awesome. but, the th- but the thing is it, you know something like that it, it needs something and and you know I'd love it if we could go there and there's some plaque or there's something to actually represent what was achieved on these grounds mm. because you have it with everything else you have it with outside stadiums you've got it at different tracks you've got it at football managers and all sorts of things like that this is a really significant achievement and it deserves to have something and and you know this is in the middle of a park basically where this is taking place yeah. you know it's a road in the middle of the park there's nothing to stop where you know in between those two trees that we're looking at now where the finish line was just chuck something in there just yeah, it doesn't need plaque to, or a, yeah, yeah it doesn't need to be enormous does it it just needs to be something to you know to remind people in the future that you know this is where something pretty shocking took place and yeah it deserves to be remembered no i agree no definitely yeah so finally i just want to make one last point on this i think you know outside of you know because there wasn't that many significant moments in the actual run obviously at about the no, halfway point very smooth wasn't it yeah at the halfway point you know kipchoge sort of looked like he was falling off a little bit but got back on it pretty much straight away yeah pretty instantly after the corner yeah the finish though we've got to talk about that finish because <laughs> let's be honest kipchoge doesn't often come across as the most 
emotional guy in the world, does he? He comes across as very level-headed. Very sort of calculated. He knows, yeah, level-headed, yeah. calm. And I think the most exciting thing, and I'm going to even see if I can skip towards it on our yeah, screen here, just because it's so worth, it's just so worth watching, <laughs> is that moment. And this is funny because... It's about here, actually, isn't it? Yeah, it's somewhere near here. So um, we're, we're, we're now at 157.50, so we're less than yeah. two minutes from the finish. Yeah, so... And what he's basically going to do... Yeah, here he is goes. He yeah, look, there he is. Uh, yep, there he goes. Yeah. And this is the moment that I think, yeah, it was, yeah, if there was any doubt in anyone's mind, that is when you know that it was in the bag. You know? Yeah, if Even you ever thought he might just completely fall apart or anything, when he tell, he basically puts in a little burst to move through his pacemakers, puts his arms out to the side and tells them, move out the way, I got this. Yeah. And it's interesting to actually watch where he goes past on those signs. Again, speaking to Ian, Ian, your second shout out of the pod, he was telling me that he was actually in le- in line with that area where he broke, where he sort of spread the pacemakers and said, I'm going to go for it. Oh, he that's said he, really was, cool. he was at that point. And with that being said, that was, you know, this is not like, I think if you say to most people, anyone who's out there who's running the park run this weekend or whatever you're doing, I guarantee you've always got enough gas left in the tank to sprint the uh, the last, you know, kind of, you know, a couple of hundred yards or so. Yeah, not, not even that. I reckon a lot of people they they wouldn't feel confident until they can see the finish and they've maybe got, you know, twenty yards left to go. <laughs> he breaks here with about five hundred, four hundred meters left to go. It's so a it long more, way. Was, yeah, no, it's more it's than a, that. I think it was seven, about seven hundred meters. Because you see, he does that, and then the next marker you see, is eight hundred, is six hundred to go. It is a long way. It's and a decent way out. I mean. He's a, he's a very experienced distance runner. He usually kicks from a lot further than that yeah. out in a race. And I've, I've been in races where people have kicked from further out. I've been in races where people have waited for longer. I've done it myself yeah. you know, before. But I mean, at the end of a marathon, when you've been running at a pace that's completely uncharted territory, yeah. to at any point yeah. just be like, move over, guys. I got this. I want to run quicker yeah. is insane. Uh, and and the thing is, I think everyone knew. And we're, as we watch it now, he's literally just gone over the line, just across the line, beating and, his chest. Yeah, and, the, and ele- he's still running. Yeah, and the elation that sort of goes on. You know, for me, this is this is the highlight of the whole event, obviously. Um, but the thing that made me smile and and laugh more than anything else is not so much that he ran over the line with one fifty nine on the clock. It's after he gets put down by his pacemakers after he's currently being uh, held up. It's the way that he <laughs> he's, gra- like he's, he's like a a running bar mitzvah right now. literally yeah <laughs> <He lifted> up. <laughs> that's a good way to put it um but the way that he goes and he sprints and he sprints oh he's running properly fast doing the high fives yeah. and things like that and yeah. the thing is that made me happy for a couple of reasons is you know one obviously you'd celebrate like that but we've never really seen kipchoge we've seen him not with that much emotion i mean yeah. if you see after he won his olympic title in 2016 he sort of Falls sunk to, to the knees floor a yeah bit. yeah but i mean other than that this is certainly and after berlin he runs through the line and he hugs yeah. his coach but but that was i mean that was a big hug but i don't think it was anything like this, this is, could, yeah oh, there's a whole other level but i mean yeah. it's yeah it's clear how much this meant to him yeah and i find it yeah and, and that's it and I, it almost makes you wonder if in his own mind if all those other races now the fact that he he feels like because you know let's not go down his story too much but obviously he had kind of mid-level success on the track you know it was never yeah. it was never in those <laughs> funny way to describe a past world champion but well, yeah is, i know but... he was he was not on the same level as a Kenanisa Bekele or no, a Mo Farah or no. a Haile Gabriel Selassie. Exactly, you know, so he's had that kind of what I'd call, you know, mid-level historic success, at mm. least. Maybe that's a better way to word it. But he won't be remembered for his track running. No, but the thing is, is that he's found his comfort in this. And you could tell that this is where he, you know, this is almost his date with destiny. And as he runs down here now, you know, you've never seen this beaming, you know, and him literally like a kid, you know, like, <laughs> yeah. he, he looks like a kid, doesn't he's gotta, he? He's got to be running like five minute pace. <laughs> yeah. He's running down there, high fiving. You know, and the fact Crazy. that, yeah. And, and that for me, that was, that was the moment that kind of brought it all home as it were, as, as we expected is, you know, and the fact that the whole crowd, you've got the whole of, Vienna has turned out to see him and it, it, it mm. that is that for me that is the special moment that I'll bring away from it more than anything else is going across that line and just seeing that somebody who let's be honest kind of deserves to deserves to have done this first you know oh absolutely you know to, to, for him to have achieved it is is magnificent no I couldn't agree more yeah um yeah what are, there's a couple of other little bits that we can address I mean there's people talking about the laser technology for for the pacing a uh, fun fact that I heard about that is that they had the car calibrated so accurately well, that it was, it was within about 0.2 seconds Yeah, over the entire marathon distance that that car was calibrated to go yeah. 
at the two hour marathon pace i mean that's just that's incredible that, yeah uh, that level of precision that they've gone to i mean yeah. we, i don't think we really need to say a huge amount more than that it's no. obvious that it's easier mentally for the pacemakers and it's easier for kipchoge having those lasers and having the car there to make sure that they're on the perfect pace that's fine and there's just a few more other there's a few more like people that are saying oh but what if bekele had been in the race and i think that we should talk about that just briefly before we end so what see this is things because i don't know enough about bekele's sort of career in general i know obviously that he was pretty unstoppable on the track but over the marathon cross country too yeah oh yeah no cross country was his big thing wasn't it yeah because mm. he won about was it, was it 20 gold medals in the cross country championships or something in, in the seen? world cross country it was it was something around that but what that was is he was so he would go out and he would run the short course when they had a short course at the world cross country which was a 4k yeah and he'd win that and then he'd go and he'd run the long course which is a 12k the next day brutal. and win that brutal and then Ethiopia would also generally pick up the team gold as well. So that's three yeah. gold medals per champs. And the World Cross Country was also annually in those days. Yeah. So he'd pick up, you know, almost a guaranteed three medals every year for <laughs> it was four or five years that he went undefeated yeah. at World Cross. But which, it, yeah, like that, <laughs> that adds up. Yeah. But to put him to put him into this thing, do I believe that he could have run neck and neck with Kipchoge's performance? Mm. Possibly, but let's be honest. You know, he had his impressive run in Berlin, but we don't know. I don't think anyone knows what the future holds for him beforehand because he's run two hundred three, no. hasn't he? Or two hundred three high, two hundred three low, low. Okay, two hundred three very, very low. No, fair enough. Okay, so he's done that, but but like you said, he's you know he's fallen off in marathons before, and he's you know well, he's failed to actually finish them. So to put yeah, him, in, I think what a lot of people forget about that run in Berlin as well is that he got dropped at like thirty k. Yeah. There was a time during that run where, I mean, not only did you not think Bekele would get close to Kipchoge's record, but you also didn't think that he'd even win the race. Yeah. He, I didn't even know if he was going to finish. He looked bad at one point. I mean, yeah. yeah, he came back really strong. But yeah, there was that big moment of doubt, which you just you never really see in Kipchoge. Kipchoge is a lot more stable than yeah. Bekele over the marathon distance. And the thing is, if you talk about the marathon distance, like you say, it's not that I believe that he ever ran slowly in that. 201.40 effort or 241 no, effort. Not. I mean, you can't. <laughs> Literally. Um, but this, the thing about this that I think made it so interesting is the fact that it was it was c- completely continuous. You know, there was no... Mm. There no was, ebbing and flowing of the pace or anything at yeah, all. Yeah, it, no. was, it was not, I'm going to run the first half slow in the second half. So it was just, we're going to find a pace and stick at it. Yeah. And does Bekele maybe have the same level of mental fortitude to get to the same end result who knows he he hasn't yeah. he hasn't done it yet but well, if he'd I think, have popped him in there i don't know if he'd have been able I to i think hold we need on. to see bekele race a little bit more as well before we sort of really can form an informed discussion on the kipchoge versus bekele debate yeah. i mean at the moment i'd almost undoubtedly say kipchoge has it however yeah. the bekele that we saw in berlin is a very different bekele to what we saw in or what we have seen in previous years really since his success on the track i mean if you look i always try my best not to stay away from talking about the weight of runners but if you look at him he is so much lighter than he has been in years yeah and he properly looks like an elite a world-class almost world record eligible marathon runner and that's just it's something that we've not seen from bekele in yeah. a long time since his world record's on the track. Well, potentially, here we go. Here's a way to close this because I do want to move on and just talk about the ladies' record very, very quickly. Yes. Um, more. You know, maybe just for a couple of minutes before we before we end this pod. But I think if, if we could see it, we're going to see it either maybe Tokyo, maybe Tokyo Marathon. It's hard for me to see Bikili doing it, but yeah, no, potentially. But to- Tokyo Marathon or it could be London slash Berlin next year, you know. But we'll have to say that. Yeah, no, that you see, that's the thing. With the Olympics being in August and Kipchoge almost, like, he's he's kind of committed to the Olympics. He hasn't completely, but, like, you, you just have the feeling that he's going to do that. Yeah. It does make doing London and the Olympics a bit difficult. No, I agree. Not a huge amount of athletes will do that. No. Kipchoge may do that. He's yeah. good enough to do it. But, but you don't and maybe Bekele will. Maybe Bekele will show up in London. And that's where we'll see the face of is London yeah. this year. But there you go. That could be, that could be the... The you know the race that we all want to see <laughs> yeah. is is can can somebody who's 
you know, effectively proven himself continuously, go up against a person who's proven himself once, but continuously in other factors. Yeah, well, I'd say he's proven himself a few times over the yeah. marathon, but he's, yeah, is is the inconsistency wild card versus <laughs> the, you know, yeah, the, the pretty nailed on favorite. Yeah. So let's move on very quickly because, like I said, all of about 30, 35 hours later, we were treated to a bit of a spectacle. Yeah, we got to talk about this because, yeah. I mean, I'm one of quite a few people that stayed up to watch the Ineos 159 Challenge and kind of forgot about Chicago. <laughs> yeah, no, well... I, I mean, I didn't watch it, that's for sure. No, well, I I was I was at work, actually, and I had it up on... I just had it on the on the screen. I had the Twitter feeds from the Chicago Marathon just to see mm-hmm. what was going on. And I was most focused on the men's race, as I, yeah, as I as think you would be, everyone yeah. was. Partly because Mo Farah, obviously British champion, who has maybe failed in... Defending... You know, not failed. Defending but, Chicago champion as well, there he was. Yeah. But that's it, yeah. You know, he's maybe... He's fallen off the mark a couple of times in london but chicago mm-hmm. could have been his race and especially as you know that you're not going to have the likes of you know kipchoge there yep you know what what could happen and unfortunately Mar- uh mo farah fell off and i think he finished about ninth in the end which was he was yeah shame. he had a he had a tough day yeah. I, do you know what i can't even remember who won the men's race no <laughs> no where well, it was pro- i think the finishing time was 205 something yeah, rather, which, something around that which is about the same time that mo ran last year to win it and then i think yeah. galen rupp the year before who also had a pretty rough go yeah who's yeah was most former training partner and yeah. also former well no i think he was right up until the day that they got axed yeah. member of uh yeah, nike a, oregon project yeah he was big big in we'll, yeah, we'll, yeah well we'll try and not mention that as much as possible because i think no. that's something that we could go on for yeah, many definitely. many minutes but yeah so as this uh as this race developed all of a sudden i remember seeing these tweets go you know these tweets going oh you know cost guy watch out here you know this could be something mm. you know but it, it's so hard to tell but her her race plan that i heard after she was done was i wanted to go out fast and just make sure that i was in my own space basically she mm. She almost said, I deliberately didn't want it to be a race. And, you know, spoiler alert ahead, she went on and she smashed. We're talking about best part of a minute. <laughs> yeah, she absolutely took it apart. It was yeah. 2.14 low. Yeah. And this is this is a record. I think it's well worth mentioning that when we were running, uh, when I was down at the track once with Project 5, uh, when we were doing our own training, yeah. I distinctly remember you saying the words to me, Paula Radcliffe's marathon record will never be broken. Yeah, I, I honestly, I thought it would take a... I, a yeah, decade, no, I, yeah. I just, I didn't think it would be broken in this era of, yeah. of running. And I'm going to have to come back to it. I'm going to have to come back to the shoes. Yeah. I mean, if you say that those shoes give a male, mar- like elite marathon runner, two minutes yeah, running at, you know, 204 kind of pace, then what does it give you when you're running 214? Yeah. No. You know, if, you, if you're talking, if you're... If, if that's three minutes, that suddenly makes that run representative without the shoes of a 217. And that's still an incredible run. That's still, I think, was the second or third fastest any female has ever run for the marathon distance. Yeah. But, I mean, you know, it's like, it's not the 214. It's not the crazy 214 that we're seeing. And I think that the, the shoes can't be ignored as no. being a main main factor in that performance no inter- interesting that yeah you, what is, it. you know what does paula run if you put her in those does she run like 213 212 yeah <laughs> Do we, yeah you know well yeah it does yeah a couple of things i think are well worth making note of though is that it's interesting because paula ratcliffe set her not super fast world marathon record but a, like a 217 type marathon record in chicago mm. and then it was then london where she set her fast one yep and the ladies only world record is set in London. And, you know, I don't know, have they made changes to the Chicago course or anything? Because. So, Chicago, I mean, Chicago is a very quick course. Yeah. But from what I know about it, it's not the quickest course in the world. I mean, it's, yeah. it's up there. It's certainly one of them. Yeah. But it, I but find. It's not, it, yeah, it's not a Berlin or a London. Yeah. Well, I find it interesting because that says, you know, if Koska has done this already. Yeah, you know, could she potentially go on and and do something really special? Could she go in, quick? Yeah, no, in, not, I wouldn't in, be surprised if she could. And could she do it? You know, and yeah, I think that I mean that's that's really what I want to touch on is the fact that she went over it and the fact that she was so close to you know to I think it was like fourteen oh four or something like it was you know it was even close to starting with a thirteen. <laughs> you know, it was this unbelievable <laughs> run. Insane. 
And a couple of things I thought were interesting, um, whilst we still got Ineos on the screen, is that I found it interesting that Paula Radcliffe wasn't in Vienna. She actually was in Chicago. And mm. yeah, I th- yeah, there was that kind of passing of the torch moment. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm sure that has something to do with just contracts and you know, Nike and things of that nature. But, I mean... Sorry, there's a really annoying noise going on in the background here. I think oh, yeah, there's on a, the field. Yeah, there's a tractor, yeah. Yeah, beg, wonderful. Beg your pardon, listeners. <laughs> that was a bit distracting. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure that has something to do with... She was. She must have been contracted to go to Chicago and didn't really have any obligations to be in Vienna, so didn't really yeah. feel the need to. No. Um, but yeah, it was quite... It, I suppose if we're looking at it in the most positive light possible, it was really nice that she was able to be there for the the changing of the guard. Yeah. Of handing over her record to Koskai, and there's a there's a picture of them after the race where she looks a damn sight happier than Koskai <laughs> does. Yeah, yeah, you wouldn't have thought that she just won a world record. <laughs> no, but but well, from the it looks like Paula had just like I don't know. Yeah, beating her in a fight or something. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. It, well, I mean, what a remarkable weekend. And I think, to be fair, you know, we there's not a huge amount more to touch on, seeing as neither of us watched the Chicago Marathon. No. Yeah. You know? I think all we can do is just summarize that. Yeah. I mean, one of the craziest weekends in distance running history. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, I can't. Yeah. There's not many else. Not many other opportunities where you can have a specialist event followed by a legitimate, you know, major marathon. No. So, exactly. I mean, for all intensive purposes, the fastest a man has ever run for the marathon and the fastest a woman has ever run for a marathon within hours of each other. Yeah, it's remarkable. And, and you know, to, to bring it back round and maybe we could artistically close off the pod in this way before we do our little, intru- our little uh, you know, not introduction, what's the opposite of an introduction? Outro. Outro, farewell, <laughs> is, you know, is you do have to look at this and whether you look at it from a shoes perspective, a performance, training, whatever perspective, but, you know, you do have to say Kipchoge was right. You know, the whole no human is limited. Yeah, he's yeah. he certainly was right. He's dead right, yeah, and yeah, and, yeah and, well, especially since it looked like he probably could go a little bit quicker than <laughs> that. There's yeah, where is the limit? Is there one? Yeah, and do you know what? I think I'll be watching Kipchoge very closely over the next couple of years to find out if there is, <laughs> find out if if he is the limit. Or yeah, if there's something exactly. Else. Oh yeah, you never know. You never know. Where's the next Kipchoge going to come from? No. But no, either way, I mean, it's been a fun podcast to review the events of of that incredible weekend of of athletic performance over the marathon distance thank you everyone for tuning in and listening to us ramble on for the best part of an hour now yep we promised everyone that we promised ourselves this one would be a bit shorter but you know how it goes yeah well we said half an hour and we've almost doubled it but hey hey, i mean we're not as we're not as subject to times as kipchoge is so (laughs) apologies for our lack of punctuality there no well uh as long as you keep tuning in and as long as you're enjoying it we will keep making more because we love doing this as well so thanks again everyone for listening and we will join you on the next one see you next time